Good morning. Welcome to Westover Baptist Church online worship service. We are so glad you have chosen to join us today as we worship the Lord together. Know that while we may not be worshiping in the same space, God has his richest blessings for you as you view this service. We invite you to download the worship service bulletin on our homepage. Wherever you find yourself in life, we want this to be a worship experience you can depend on for receiving inspiration, encouragement, and support. Now, wherever you are, whether it's at the kitchen table or on the couch, get comfortable and enjoy the service. Our first hymn this morning is number 524, We're Marching to Zion. announcements. The COVID-19 pandemic has certainly changed each of our lives, and one of the ways it has made a significant change all around the world and here in the Arlington community is increasing the need for food assistance. We have partnered for a number of years with the Arlington Food Assistance Center, and typically we have food drives at least two times per year. The need is greater, so we ask that you join us in supporting our neighbors in need and drop off canned goods and non-perishable foods that will be donated to the Arlington Food Assistance Center. The drop-off location is at the church, and the donation box is inside of door two, which is left of the flagpoles, facing Patrick Henry Drive. We thank you for your support. Although we're not able to be on campus for worship service and for our other ministry activities, we do have ongoing expenses to maintain the building, support staff, and provide community support. We're grateful to those who have been able to continue to give during this time. It has been very helpful to us. We are providing several ways you can give. You can give online, or through our church website. If you go to our website, there is a button that is marked Give on the right-hand side of the home page. You can click on that button and you're asked for particular information about your gift. You can set up your gift as a one-time gift or a recurring gift and then provide your banking information. Using your mobile phone, you can give by texting. Send a text message to the number 73256. And then, in the body of the text message, you would type in capital W, capital C, capital A, 
lowercase r, and lowercase l, and the amount of your gift, and hit enter. Then a screen will appear and ask you for your banking or credit card information. You may also continue to mail your gift to the church. The mail is monitored daily, or you may drop off your gift to the church and put it in the church mail slot, which is the door between the flagpoles facing Patrick Henry Drive. Some of you may take advantage of online banking through your own bank and have a bank send a check through the mail. You may use any of these methods to provide your gift and we sincerely appreciate your support. Thank you. Our scripture reading is titled, God Does Great Things. It is taken from Psalm 126, verse 1 through 6. When the Lord changed Zion's circumstances for the better, it was like we had been dreaming. Our mouths were suddenly filled with laughter. Our tongues were filled with joyful shouts. It was even said at that time among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. Yes, the Lord has done great things for us, and we are overjoyed. Lord, change our circumstances for the better, like dry streams in desert waste. Let those who plant with tears reap the harvest with joyful shouts. Let those who go out crying and carrying their seed come home with joyful shouts, carrying bales of grain. God add a blessing to the hearing and obedience of his word. Our next hymn is number 441, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought Since Jesus came into my heart I have light in my soul for which all I have sought Since Jesus came into my heart of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows grow since Jesus came into my heart I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart I am happy so happy as onward I go since Jesus came joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Hello, I'm Reverend Michael Youngblood. Welcome. Welcome to our worship service. Welcome to the family of Westover Baptist Church. We're very excited that you could be with us today. Today is a very special day. This is a day that we worship the Lord. Let me read to you Psalm, the 150th Psalm, verses verse 1 and 2. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His acts of power. Praise Him for His surpassing greatness. God is great. And we come to worship Him and praise Him in spirit and in truth. We praise Him in our bodies because this is His temple, the Bible tells us. We praise Him in our homes because this is a place that we have dedicated to Him. 
which is a gift to us from him. Let us praise and worship God. I said today is a very special today. Today we celebrate our church 80th anniversary. That's a long time. This is a very special time in the life of our church. Today we remember on July 21st, 1940, individuals met together in Swanson Junior High School, which is across the street, to come together to recognize and to say there needs to be a house of worship in this community to our God. Less than a month later, they met together on August the 12th and formally formed or organized this church that we know as Westover Baptist Church, calling as their first pastor, Reverend Perry Mitchell. As I said, a lot has taken place since then. But let me share with you some thoughts that I've had over the past few days. Because of their health, several trees on the campus had to be removed. One of them was a Japanese maple that was outside of my office. I remember this tree when it was much healthier and much fuller. I dare say that every preschool child that has come to this, this preschool at this church has either climbed or ran around this tree. While it had provided an adventure for climbing, it all, its, its large trunks and cradling base also provided security, and I'm sure a peace of mind for the parents as they watch their children, the toddlers, climb this tree. The trunk has not been removed yet, and I'm really co contemplating or seriously thinking about maybe not having it removed. Why? It tells a story. It tells a story from its very beginning until the time that it was cut down. It tells a story about our community. You see, each ring represents a year of growth of this tree. The center dot is the first year. And progressive rings, again, represent as this tree has grown. And there's a message there within the simplicity of these rings. As we look at them, we can see where the rings are further apart. That was a good year. That was a year when there was ample water supply and the tree grew healthy and strong. The light color wood that you see is an indication of growth during the early spring or the spring and the early summer. And the darker lines that you see in the rings represent the growth of the tree during fall months and late summer. Over the past 80 years, a great number of things have changed and occurred. I cannot help but think about the conditions that existed when these individuals came together to organize this church. Less than 10 months before they met in July, Germany had invaded Poland, beginning World War II in Europe. Less than a month after that first meeting, they came together officially, 76 charter members, and started Westover Baptist Church. They called Reverend Perry Mitchell as their first pastor, and that same year, with $4,500, they purchased the campus that the church now sits on. Seven months to the day after ground was broken to start the first chapel, Japan bombed Pearl Harbor. Four days after that, Germany declared war on America. Why am I citing these details? Because the rings of the tree indicate growth and the dark blotches indicate times of or incidents of trauma to the tree. Like this tree, Westover has experienced growth 
tremendous in some seasons. Like this tree, our church has experienced trauma. But yet, like this tree, we can continue to grow until God calls us home, until he says it's the end. These saints that began this church 80 years ago, these 76 charter members, started a ministry that ministered to thousands of individuals in this community and around the world. Some of them have gone on to be with the Lord and they're enjoying their rest from their labor. But others, like the autumn leaves blown by the wind, have been scattered all over the world. We will continue to conduct ministries that minister to our community. We will continue to seek the salvation of the lost. We will continue to tell men and women, boys and girls, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Today we thank God that he has blessed us for 80 years. Today we thank God for the opportunity to worship him and to serve him. So as we look around at our world today, the impact of the COVID-19 virus, the chaos, the confusion that, that is taking place in our nation, the injustices that are being felt far and wide, don't despair, don't lose hope. The same God that brought this church through World War II, through the Korean War, through times of prosperity in our nation, times of conflict, will bring us through even today. We don't know what looms over the horizon, we don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future, and that's our God. If we will follow his guidance that he gave us in 2 Chronicles, the 7th chapter and the 14th verse, he will heal our land. I would challenge you to read that scripture and memorize it. 2 Chronicles 7.14 it's God's guidance how we can be healed as a nation. God loves us. He loves us so much that he gave us his best. He gave us his son to die on Calvary's cross. And he told us, go into the vineyard and work. And whatever is right, I will pay you. Eighty years from now, what will be said of you and I? Will we like those saints 80 years ago, despite what was going on, praise God and trusted him and did everything they could to advance the kingdom of God? Will that be our record? Will that be said of us? What will be said of you when these times have passed, when God has delivered us, what will be the sign, the display of your faith? I think like the prophet said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Time brings about a change. Some changes are good. Some changes are not so good. Some changes are pleasant. And some changes are bitter. But our God does not change. And he's invited us, he's welcomed us to have a relationship with him and to commune with him through prayer. The 121st song speaks to our relationship with God and his strength. It says, I will lift up my eyes into the mountains. No. My help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will not slumber nor sleep. 
The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch, out your, watch over your going out and your coming in, both now and forever. Won't you join me in prayer as we pray to our God? Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to come to you in prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you have made yourself available to us. The psalm says that you're only a prayer away. And so, dear Lord, we come to you now. We come to you as our creator, the one who made us, the one who made everything in the universe, the one who holds us in his hands. Our worship service, Lord, continues, contains songs of praise. We hear your, you speaking to us through the Bible and through the sermon that is brought to us. But also, Lord, you've given us the opportunity to come to you individually and collectively now to pray to you. So, Lord, hear our prayer and answer our call. You are our mighty God, the one that does not sleep nor slumber. But Lord, you are mindful of us, the Bible tells us. Your actions and your love demonstrate that we are more than a passing thought to you. Every day of our life, you show your love towards us. Lord, we do not know what the future holds for us, but we know you hold the future. Jesus, America needs peace and justice for all. Proverbs 21 and 3 tells us to do justice and judgment because it is more acceptable to, acceptable to you than sacrifice. Let there be justice in America for all. We need your peace. May the peace that you promised come over our nation. May every individual live out your command to love their neighbor as they love themselves. May America humble itself to you. May we in our words, thoughts, and deeds express our thankfulness for your blessing to us. Lord, in our individual lives, manifest your love and your will. You are aware of each challenge we are facing. Where our finance are lacking, please provide. Where our health is failing, heal us, we pray. Show your love to our family members and loved ones. Is there a problem that we have that is too hard for you to resolve? No. Are you able to provide for our every need? Yes, you are. We leave all in your hands, including ourselves. We love you, knowing that you first loved us. We pray this prayer in the authority given to us by our Lord and Savior, the Son of God, Jesus the Christ, who died for our sins. Amen. Today, we are privileged to have as our guest speaker, the Reverend Dr. Emel Thomas, pastor of Jerusalem Baptist Church in Palo Alto, California. Reverend Thomas is a native of Flint, Michigan, he received his Doctor of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. You can read more of his bio there in our program that is available through the website. He's a husband of Reverend Chandra Lewis Thomas and a proud father of Christina and Zoe. 
He's also my friend and my pastor. If there's any credence to the saying, it takes one to know one, Pastor Thomas is an anointed preacher by God. He teaches and he preaches. I enjoyed the time that he served as my pastor at Zion Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. Always a very meaningful and spirit-filled sermon delivered to this church by him. So now, attentively listen as he shares with us a message from God on this special day that we recognize the gift and the blessing that God has given this church to actively serve our community for 80 years. I and my spirit feel he has many more years that he needs to use us or wants to use us. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, won't you please hear God's messenger, Reverend Dr. Emel Thomas, as he brings the word of life to us. Good morning, my sisters and brothers of the Westover Baptist Church, to the great pastor of this church, Michael Youngblood, his beautiful bride, and to this wonderful congregation. It is an honor to be invited to share on this the occasion of your 80th church anniversary. Happy birthday, y'all. 80 years is no small feat. God has blessed you and God has brought you from a mighty long way. And I'm honored to uh, be invited to share on this occasion with my wonderful friend, Pastor Youngblood, um, with your darling congregation. Thank you, Pastor Youngblood. God bless you, Pastor Youngblood. May the Lord continue to use you mightily as you go forth in ministry. Well, I'd like to just get right to the Word of God. How about that? Let's look, if you will, at the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 46, where we are going to examine verses 9 and 10. Ezekiel chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, will be the focus of our sermonic discussion today. Ezekiel 46, 9 and 10 reads as follows in the New International Version. When the people of the Lord come before the Lord at the appointed feasts, whoever enters by the north gate to worship is to go out at the south gate. And whoever enters by the south gate is to go out the north gate. No one is to return through the gate by which he entered, but each is to go out the opposite gate. The prince is to be among them, going in when they go in and going out when they go out. Today, we want to talk from the topic, keep it moving. Now, Ezekiel's vision of the millennial temple and its rights and regulations of temple traffic was a prophetic preview of things to come. This entire 46th chapter of Ezekiel is telling us how the temple will operate in the millennial when Christ rules on earth. Now we all know that the temple was a house of prayer and a place of worship. Thousands came to those courts daily, millions annually, especially at the great feasts and festivals. Now in the millennial kingdom, even though Christ will be reigning and ruling on earth, isn't it interesting that there are rules and regulations for orderly worship? When Christ is on earth, there will be meticulous directions for how to glorify him in his temple. For the glory of the temple was not only in the Shekinah of the inner court, but in the systems of the outer court. Not only in the awesomeness of God's presence, 
but also in the orderliness of God's people. Not only in the facilities of the temple, but in the flow of the traffic. Now, the Apostle Paul said this. He said, all things should be done decently and in order. Uh, God is not glorified in confusion. Now, here's the kind of person I am. Whenever I go into a church and they don't have a printed order of worship, I get nervous. I get uneasy when I go and they don't hand me a bulletin. I need to know where things are headed. If you don't have it in a printed program, put it on a screen, put it on a wall, something. I just need some order so I can know where things are headed. So for a moment today, let's fix our focus on the future so we can understand how to function in the present. Let's look at how tomorrow will be so we can see how today should be. As a matter of fact, anything that can get my mind off of 2020, I'll take it right now. Take me into the sweet by and by so that I can deal with this nasty here and now that has fallen upon us in this year. I notice in this scripture, there is an orderly flow of traffic. Essentially, what Ezekiel is saying is keep it moving. If you come in at the north gate, go out the south gate, but keep it moving. If you come in at the south gate, then go out at the north gate, but keep it moving. Don't stop, don't stay, don't stand, don't become stationary, don't become stagnated. And whatever you do, don't go out the same way you came in, just keep it moving. Now this dovetails with your theme. For your theme scripture, the second verse, Philippians 1 and 6 says, he that began a good work in you will continue it until the day of Christ. So if Christ keeps it moving, then we should keep it moving because orderly movement in our walk and worship brings glory to the Lord. I see three things in this text. First of all, I see the principle of progress. Notice that no one is standing still in the temple. No one is to be dormant. Everyone was coming from different places, but they had to keep it moving in a forward direction. It was a principle of progress. No matter how they came in, they had to go out another way. No matter where they came from, they had to move in a forward direction. You come in from the north, you got to go out the south. You come in by the south, you got to go out the north. It is a principle of perpetual progress. Now listen, the reason Westover is here today is simply because you were able to progress over the course of 80 years. You never became stuck. You never became stapled to one place in history there was always forward movement. I don't even have to know you to know that you have had to employ perpetual progress or you wouldn't be here today. During the fight against fascism in the 40s, you kept it moving. During the financial prosperity of the 50s, you kept it moving. During the social upheaval of the 60s, you kept it moving. During the self-centered 70s, you kept it moving. During the egotism of the 80s, you kept it moving. During the narcissism of the 90s, you kept it moving. Throughout the technological development of the 2000s, you kept it moving. Amidst the tremendous transformations of the 2010s, you kept it moving. And right now, amidst the trials and the tribulations of 2020, here you are celebrating 80 years because you kept it moving all along. Now notice here, the worshipers are coming from different places. Some come from the south, some come from the north. They're all coming from different places and different perspectives, but they all keep it moving. That lets us know, sisters and brothers, that no matter what our differences are, we still 
must keep it moving in the church of Jesus Christ. Generational differences shouldn't hold up traffic in the church. One day, a deacon came in to talk to a pastor uh, with his son. The deacon was uh, in his 60s. The son was uh, in his early 30s. And uh, the deacon had a complaint. He said, Pastor, uh, will, will, will you please tell my son that he shouldn't be coming to church in blue jeans and jerseys and tennis shoes? I said, what you mean, deacon? He said, well, 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 Pastor, I was taught that we're supposed to give God our best. That's, that's why I've got on my suit. That's why I've got on my tie, because I was taught to dress my best to give God my best in worship. So the pastor said, well, Deke, uh, that's nice. What you got on is, is looking pretty good. Uh, how much did that suit you got on cost? He said, well, I got this suit for, for $99, and uh, the, the salesman threw in my tie in the pocket square. So what about those shoes? He said, they look like gators. He said, well, they're not really gators. They are imitation gators, but I got them in the back of the store for $50. He said, all right, they look, they look good, D. He said, now, Junior, what about you? Uh, what, what kind of shoes you got? Ain't that some Jordans? He said, yeah. He said, how much them Jordans cost? He said, $150. He said, oh. He said, well, what about those pants that you got on those jeans? How much were those jeans? He said, well, these jeans were $200. He said, isn't that a Cleveland Browns throwback jersey you're wearing? How much was that? He said, $300. And the, the pastor looked at the deacon and said, Deke, I think he got your beat. He said, what you mean, pastor? He said, well, you're talking about giving God your best. Looks like you gave him $150 and your son gave him $650. So the reality is, is that you cannot judge whether a person from a certain generation is giving God their best because of their outward appearance. Matter of fact, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart anyway. We just come from different perspectives. We came in different doors. We came in from different generational portals, but that shouldn't hold back the progress of our work. Cultural differences shouldn't hold up the traffic. The truth is that in the Church of Jesus Christ, uh, Many of us have come from different cultural doors. All of us have some cultural baggage from our background. Maybe you came through a door from uh, a Black Northern experience. Maybe you came in the door of a Black Southern cultural experience. Maybe you came from a White Southern cultural experience. Maybe you came from a White Northern cultural experience. Maybe you are an old line Virginian who has been around ever since the Mayflower. Maybe you come from Africa and you bring your Afrocentric perspective to the church. Perhaps you are from Latin America and you bring your Latin culture and background. I don't know who's in your congregation. Maybe there's someone from Asia, but certainly they bring that to the worship experience. But no matter what door we come in, that should not hold up our progress. Once we come in, we ought to keep it moving and move to the other side as we move forward on one accord. Matter of fact, all of these external differences are not as important as our internal similarities. Here's what Acts 17, 26 says. It says, out of one blood hath God made all the nations to dwell on the face of the earth. And he's determined their allotted time in history and the boundaries of their habitation. So that's what we are as a human race. We're one blood and many nations, one blood and many families. One blood, many colors, many cultures, but we're all of one blood and we've all been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. So keep it moving and don't let the cultural differences hold back the progress. Growth experiences shouldn't hold up the progress of the church. A mother was downstairs. She heard a dull thud upstairs. She ran upstairs and she noted that little Johnny had fallen out of the bed. 
She said, oh, Johnny, get up. Let's get you back in bed. He got back in bed. She went downstairs, began to watch TV. Again, a dull thud. She went upstairs, and Johnny had fallen out of the bed. She helped a little boy back in bed. She went downstairs again, and after about an hour, another dull thud. She, she went upstairs, said, Johnny, you, you keep falling out of the bed and getting in the bed, getting in the bed and falling out of the bed. What's wrong? Why do you keep falling out the bed? Said, well, Mama, I guess I stayed too close to where I got in. And uh, that, that's what happens to us sometimes. Uh, our religious experience, our spiritual uh, experience is one of falling out and getting up and, and getting up and falling out because we stayed too close to where we got in. No matter how you came into the church, you need to keep it moving. She told Johnny, she said, she said, move over a little closer to the wall. The bed was up against the wall. Move over a little closer to the wall. Maybe you won't fall out. So no, no matter how you got into the church of God, move a little bit from where you got in. Move, move a little bit towards Sunday school. Move, move towards evangelism. Move, move towards some of the outreach ministries in the church. Get a move on. You came in with prayerlessness. Now keep it moving towards prayerfulness. You came in uh, with helplessness, but now keep it moving towards helpfulness. You came in maybe even high on drugs or alcohol, but keep it moving till you learn how to get high on the Holy Ghost. Wherever you are in your growth experience, don't hold up the traffic. Just keep it moving. You come in the south, go out the north. You come in the north, go out the south. Just keep it moving with a principle of progress. Even technological differences shouldn't hold up traffic. Now, now, uh, right now, I'm, I'm broadcasting, I'm recording this message. Now, now, I'm generationally a boomer. I was always taught that preaching should be done from a pulpit in a suit with a congregation all around me saying amen, cheering me on, and responding verbally to the word of God. People told me that I needed to start video ministries. People told me to develop my technological acuity, but I was so slow. I, I, I don't like to hear my own voice. I, my teachers told me I'm supposed to listen to my sermons to critique myself. I never did that over these many years. Told me I should watch videos of myself. I hate to see myself, but look at me. I'm looking right now at a picture of myself talking, and I've got to do it in order to engage in ministry. The pandemic of this year has kicked me away from the boomer door and has propelled me towards the other side of the kingdom so that technologically I've got to become conversant with social media. I have multiple cameras in here I've got to use. I've got lighting rings I've got to put on. I've become a producer. I've become a connector. I have to function with Zoom. I have to know how to stream. I've got to get many different kinds uh, of um, Wi-Fi connections in order to do what I need to do. Last Sunday, uh, I, I live stream to Facebook and to YouTube and to Periscope and to Twitch TV. I'm learning, but I got a long way to go. Well, what am I going to do? I'm just going to keep it moving. Whatever door I came in, I can't stay stuck and stagnant there. I've got to move to the other door. I'm like the Apostle Paul who said, I claim myself not to have apprehended. I haven't arrived. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind me, I keep it moving. I press towards the mark of the prize of a high calling in Christ Jesus. It's the principle of progress. But then number two, I see a prohibited procedure. What is the pro prohibited procedure? I'm glad you asked. Nobody could go in reverse. Notice what it says here. It says, once you get in, you can't go out the door 
that you came in. There's no going back. There's no reversing. You've got to keep it moving. That's the prohibited procedure. You can't go out the way you came in. One of my children, some years ago, I will not call her name to protect the innocent, but one of my children was watching Tom and Jerry on the big screen TV in Waldorf, Maryland. She had to go to the bathroom, but she was so enjoying the, the show that her attention was on the show, but her body was telling her she had to go to the bathroom. So she was going to the bathroom while looking back at the TV and she cracked her head on the side of the counter and fell out on the floor. We rushed to her. We picked her up to see if she was okay. She was rubbing her head, but she was all right. But, but I had to say, baby, listen to daddy. God put your eyes on the front of your head so you could focus on where you're going and not where you've been. Now, now look, I, I know that this is a day of history. This is a day of celebrating 80 years of ministry in Arlington, Virginia. We ought to respect our history. We ought to remember our history. We ought to hold our history in reverence. But we have to be careful how we do it because if we look back too long, and, and, and with too much energy, we'll whack our heads on our way to where we should be going and end up sprawled on the floor, unable to move forward. So, so, so glance backward, but gaze forward. Peek backward, but peer forward. Flash back, but don't face back. Focus forward because it's prohibited to go in reverse. I came up here to the church uh, in uh, my wife's car. She's got a wonderful car. It's a rage with all the families out here in Silicon Valley. It's called the Infinity QX60. It's silver, it's sleek, it's off the chain. It's got all the newfangled high-tech gadgets in it. Thank God I've got a rich, smart wife, or I couldn't do nothing but stand still or go backward. But but, but I took her car to get here because it's got all the good stuff in it. Now, she's got this thing in her car, y'all, that is uh, on the console, and it's called a rear view camera. I don't even really know how to use it, but you're supposed to use it when you're backing up. Now, I, I can't do it. I, I, I I have to put my arm across the seat, turn my head around, and turn the wheel to look back to see where I'm going. I, I can't use the rear view camera, but she is proficient with it. She uses it uh, with great nimbleness, but I can't do it. But, but I noticed one thing about it. It works very well as long as the car is in reverse. But as soon as you put the car in drive, the rear view display disappears because you've got to keep your eyes on the road ahead to stay safe. Now, this Sunday, my sisters and brothers, we're looking at the rear view. We're looking at where we've been, and that's good. That's fine. We ought to celebrate it. We ought to, 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 to really re re revere those who have brought us thus far along the way. But, but as soon as this day is over, put the car back in drive, let the camera go off, and face forward to what God has ahead of you. Okay, some of y'all are like me, huh? You, 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 you really don't have like a newfangled car that does all that kind of good stuff. Well, well, maybe you got a car like mine. If we want to know what's going on behind us, it's got a rear view mirror. That's what my car has. It has a rear view mirror. But have you noticed this? The rear view mirror in your car is about that big. But 
the windshield is about the rearview mirror is but the windshield is you know why because westover where you have been in the past 80 years from the perspective of god is only but what god has in front of you is get the picture your future is greater than your past your destiny is greater than your history the latter shall be greater than the former for the westover baptist church so the prohibited procedure is that you go in reverse glance back but gaze forward peek back but peer forward flashback but don't face back, face forward to what ha God has for you in your future. Well, my time is up. I see a principle of progress. I see a prohibited procedure, but I also see the presence of the prince. Look at what it says here. It says the prince that is among the people will go in and out with them. That is, the people were not left to their own devices. They had sacred, divine, royal, regal, majestic leadership right in their midst to lead them in their worship. Whether they were going in or going out, the prince would be with them. Whether they came in the north and were going out the south, the prince would be with them. Whether they came in the south and were going out the north, the prince would be with them. Without a prince, people might get distracted. Without a prince, people might get discouraged. Without the prince among them, the people might become despondent. But the scripture says that they had the presence of the prince in the millennial kingdom. That's where we're headed to, but it's a picture of where we ought to be right now. Hallelujah. My sisters and my brothers, might I suggest to you today that you came 80 years Westover Baptist Church not so much because of the principles of your progress, not so much because you abided by the prohibited procedures, but because of the presence of the prince. There was a prince in your midst for 80 years that got you this far on the journey. And we do have a prince who is with us in our walk and in our worship. A prince that was born in Bethlehem. A prince that walked the dusty roads of Galilee. A prince that healed the sick and raised the dead. A prince that climbed up on a cross and died for your sins and mine. A prince that went into a grave but rose on the third day with all power in his hand. We've got a prince with us who said he would never leave us or forsake us. And he's with us, whether we're going or coming. Wherever you come from, he's walking with you. Wherever you're headed, he's right by your side. The prince is going and coming with you and me. Now I know that we could only glance back. But can I glance back to an old hymn that I remember that reminds me of the joy of the prince? It says, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the son of God discloses. He speaks, the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. 
and he walks with me. He talks with me. He tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. With the prince on our side, we can keep it moving. That is my prayer for you, Westover Church, as you celebrate a laudable legacy of 80 years of ministry that you'll listen to these words of Ezekiel, that you look into the future and draw the future into the present. Get some principles for progress. Shun some prohibited procedures and celebrate the fact that you've got the presence of the prince. God bless you as you keep it moving to the destiny and the ministry that God has for your church. God bless you. God inspired prophets to tell that Jesus was coming. Emmanuel, God with us. One prophet also said he would be the Prince of Peace. Dr. Thomas spoke of this Prince that would be with us this prince we know by the name of Jesus the Christ, and he gave his life for you and for I. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. The abundant life in Christ is not just wealth and good times here in this life, but is the life for eternity. He gave his life that your sins would be forgiven and all he asks you to accept him as his Lord, as your Lord and your Savior. This is an invitation to Christian discipleship. A disciple is one who follows and learns from the master. Jesus is our master. Our ways are to be his ways. If you have not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is the opportunity for you to give your life to him, for you to accept him, for you to invite him into your life, to be your master, to be your Lord and your savior. It's a very simple process. And it's a demonstration of love and trust. Not just in this life, but in the life to come. Jesus is prompts that he will never leave us, nor will he forsake us but that he would be with us always, even until the end of the age. Romans 10 and nine outlines the process by which we can accept Jesus, that we can ask him to come into our life, to repent and to believe and to confess. Won't you pray this prayer with me if you have not made Jesus your Lord and savior? Lord, I repent of the wrong that I've done the sins that I have committed against your commandments. And Lord, to the best of my ability, with all that is in me, I will live my life according to your will. I believe, Jesus, you are the Son of God, that you died on the cross on Calvary's hill to pay the price for the sins of all humanity, and that if I accept you, my sins are forgiven. I believe, Lord, not only that you died that day, but then you rose from the dead. And because you live, if I invite you into my life, I will live. I'll never be separated from you again. My heart and my life are yours. In Jesus name. Amen. If you have asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, it's done. It's guaranteed. Jesus said, the day that you invite me into your life, I will come and I'll be there and I'll bring the Holy Spirit with me. The Holy Spirit is our guide. He is our, our reminder of the things that we have learned that God has taught us and showed us. So I congratulate you. Once saved, always saved. 
I encourage you to now unite with a church, a church that is Bible-based, that follows the Bible, a church that teaches the Bible. You're welcome to become a member of our congregation. If I can help you or lead you to another church that is close to you, I'll be more than happy to. Won't you reach out and touch me, bases with me? Won't you contact me and let me know of the decision that you have made? I would love to share my thoughts with you, some help along the way as you start this Christian journey. Does this mean life will be perfect? No, it doesn't. But it does mean that you will never be separated from Jesus, your friend, a friend who said he laid down his life for you. God bless you. I am very thankful that you joined us today. I pray that something that was sung, something that was said, something in a prayer, something in the sermon touched your heart to help you, to minister to you, to encourage you. There's hope in Jesus. There's encouragement in Jesus. I also want to thank from the bottom of my heart, Reverend Dr. Thomas for bringing the message to us. You know, in, in these times when you're used to having a congregation or someone in front of you to speak to you, it can be a challenge to speak to a computer screen. But God has gifted Pastor Thomas in many ways. And I thank him for taking time from his schedule, for making a way that we could bring this recording, his message to you. I pray for him and his family and that God will continue to bless his ministry. Truly, he is a messenger of God. I'm glad and I'm proud and I'm humbled to be able to call him my friend and I'm honored to be able to call him my pastor. Pastor Thomas, thank you. You, my friends, thank you for being with us today. And may God bless you and may God keep you. Let me pray our prayer of benediction. Dear Father, as we leave this time, focused to worship you, touch our lives that wherever we go, whatever we do, whatever we say, it will be a testament to you and your love. You've told us to let our light so shine that men and women will see our works and give you the praise and the glory. Thank you for Pastor Thomas, dear Lord. Bless his family. I pray for everyone, Lord, that has the ability to view and worship with us in this time. I pray for our world. I pray for our nation. I pray for our homes and I pray for us. Thank you, Lord, I pray in Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. And I know that he will keep you.